questions, please ask them. This is the time. I do have a question. Of course you do. Regarding. I had a feeling uh, you were going to ask too. Yeah. Specifically. Uh, uh, what sorry. do you think I'm right? I'm going to ask. Uh, you had no, a feeling of what? I don't know what it was, but I was like, I bet Kimberly's okay. going to ask a question. She's always uh, so curious. I saw that you're selling fan art on Foundation. Yeah. And I was wondering how it works, like in this industry, when you sell fa fan art. The only thing that you can do, as long as it's uh, of satire, that can be considered fair use. So essentially, mm. as long as it's not like legit competing with the IP itself, you tend to be fine, to be honest, right? Um, so for instance, there was an example of the Power Rangers movie that they did with like some of the original cast, right? Mm. And it was like dark and gritty, you know? which might not be consistent, but it was like enough that it can confuse uh, real fans, right? Mm. Why is this the case? Because look at stuff like Superman, right? Like they made a dark and gritty version of that, for instance, or Batman, right? You know, versus like the Adam West version, you know? Um, there is very, very little chance that they're going to make a spin-off version of uh the mario characters right being like hyper realistic drug addicts <laughs> you know that's and what it's, insane though yeah yeah uh and even then i don't even call it like i call it plumbers but there's a lot of similarities there you know um there was a a movie called uh space balls have you ever seen that or yep. heard about yeah yeah. It's a good example. It had nothing to do with Star Wars, but if you know anything about anything, it clearly it's being referenced by that, right? Or like the scary movie franchise. For for space for baseball, they get the agree the agreement with the uh, George Lucas though. Yeah, I think there's more of like a cuz it was very close for sure. But even yeah. then that's mm -hmm. like like if you look at scary movie or like yeah. epic movie, like those movies where they like literally make fun of other movies. Mm -hmm. right um as long as it lives in satire where it's kind of uh, appears as a as more of a joke you're definitely safe you what know? do you think about fan art in the portfolio oh i think it's a great idea as long as mm -hmm. it's fan art that uh, Original, ex maybe. yeah it expands the ip in some way mm. not like it's just like an exact replica uh, unless the fan art unless the fan art even is as an exact replica the uh the example of it being like you can see the parallel to the to the actual work like let's say you wanted to do fan art of like overwatch characters and you like design a character from overwatch mm -hmm. but just like with a different skin or something like this so it's very similar to the style it's very similar to the game it's like from a it's a character that's from that ip uh that's good too but if you Did like you draw, yeah, but if you draw literally Tracer, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's going to be harder because they already have a person who designed Tracer, Arnold Sane. And uh, he's insane. And I he's got already. The Overwatch art book is, it's very cool. Yeah. Mm. But if you like uh, drew Tracer with a different skin in Arnold Sane's style, that's good. Okay. Um, because. He would be like, oh, tight. This person can work with me, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at my StarCraft uh, yes. concepts, right? Like, that's a great example of, like, that could have been fan art, too, you know? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. if I loved StarCraft and I didn't get employed to work on it, and I'm like, you know what? They need, they need to, like, do a high-res version of these characters, right? <laughs> uh, and I did that. They, they could have hired me just specifically based off of that, you know? And be like, can you do that? But now for us, you know? <laughs> and um, I would have been like, yeah, okay. Uh, when I worked on the Sonic movie, that's what it felt like. I felt like I was just doing fan art of like the drones, like the egg, Eggman's machines and stuff. 
and uh, when they when they, everyone got really upset about the Sonic that came out, um, they reached out to me actually, and I was really hoping that they're gonna want me to redesign the Sonic because I am a fan of Sonic, and I think I know what the fans would wanted. You know, yeah, but they intern. I think they did it internally, which I think is smart. Keep it tight. Keep it close to the chest. You know, um, but I think the one that they went with, the one that's like almost a exact replica from like the game, I don't think was the best uh, choice still. But it was the safest one because. If they didn't like the other one because they felt like it was not anything near <laughs> like the original, which is fair, um, then these same people better not get pissed if it's like literally a 3D version of, <laughs> of the original, right? Yeah. Um, but there is a version where it could have been more realistic, like more live action is probably a better way of thinking about it, right? Than the one that they provided. The one that they provided was objectively not great because it was just like a small bodied human (laughs) (laughs) right it wasn't like a proportioned character you know like it didn't fit the the aesthetic of the original not because it was like looked like a monstrosity but because the proportions looked like a little person like you took a life-size person and shrunk them down that's what was wrong with it um and that looks wrong and it looks even weirder when you give him a hedgehog, like, like, anamorphic, anamorphic human hedgehog head. <laughs> you know, it makes it even worse. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, my critiques were like, they they missed out on the iconic shapes and patterns of the character. That's why people are really pissed. Uh, yeah. Iron Man is not an exact replica of the Iron Man comics, the first Iron Man. But it's fucking clearly better. It's way better. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So there there is a way to make a better Sonic. It's the same thing with the Guillermo del Toro Hellboy and the last Hellboy, I think. The concept and the overall design of the first Hellboy were so amazing that the second movie was to, even if Mignola prefers it, I think that the first two movies were on another level. Yeah, they were closer to his comic. I yeah. still think that there's a better version even than that one. But uh, if I had to pick, that is my favorite version. Mm-hmm. Uh, is the, the Del, Del Toro ones. Yeah. I agree. But anyway, uh, in terms of uh, fan art, yeah, because I did like a Smash Brothers mixed with uh, Fight Club. Right, that's that's not a thing that they're gonna do, <laughs> you know. And even if they did, it's like they themselves would have to like change the whole identity of their franchise to make that happen, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah, those are pretty clear examples. Uh, and I'm wondering, like, what about Tracer, the one? Let's say uh, someone that does a Tracer skin right. and then makes an illustration out of it. Could they sell that? Yeah, I think you can uh, sell anything, but that's that to me is where I would be like, I would not do it because that is mm. sketch. You are in danger because it's too similar to the original IP, even if it's your own original illustration. Mm. Okay. Right. And most studios, they don't bother hunting you down because it's not that big of a deal. But if the NFT is a great example. Like if it made a hundred million dollars, <laughs> right? Like you got like that Beeple money. Mm. Uh, yeah, they're gonna be knocking on your door, dude. But uh, Beeple's yeah. a great example. Uh, Cause he has a lot of like, he literally has Buzz Lightyear like in some of yeah. these things, but it's so satirical, right? It's like milking like his tits and stuff like that. <laughs> But it's just, it's not on brand at all. Like, if you cannot see that that's not Pixar, uh, an original Pixar IP, <laughs> that it's people's, like, commentary of, the, of Pixar, right? And, mm-hmm. like, uh, commercialization and stuff like this, then uh, you're not paying attention, dude. One of the most famous, uh, or at least one of my favorites of people is the one with the Game Boy and 
that's the same thing because the Game Boy design uh, is owned by Nintendo. So yeah, yeah. Just be careful. The closer it is to the original, the more scared you should be. Yes, but okay. and, mm. but even people who do like literal replicas of those I- original ideas and sell it, um, they don't get in trouble because most people, most industries don't, or most most large companies don't care. And like, you're safe. What would you do if you wanted to be legit? You know, is there a system in place for that? Uh, what do you mean legit? You wanted to sell something that's way too close and still be legit and pay royalties oh, or that's, something? That's licensing. Meaning that you would be like licensed to do so right like you when you think of a license uh and a good example is like when uh ea makes like a star wars battlefront or dice i think made that right they had to approach like you know lucas films to get the license to that ip Mm. and then they can make the star wars game and it's legit because they paid for that license a smaller example is like i mentioned earlier the music stuff right Hmm. Like, let's say you make a song and someone licensed that song. Uh, or so, yeah, that means that they would pay you some sort of compensation, whether that's through royalties of every time that thing is distributed or a flat fee. It's up to you as a licensee. That's why Disney like was like, fuck licenses. We're just going to own these motherfuckers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we're just going to outright own Marvel. We're going to outright yeah. own Star Wars. We're going to outright own, you know, Fox. <laughs> you know, they were trying to outright own Sony. You know, that's why yeah. that was that, that whole thing. And I remember when that went down, when people were like, when Sony is like, fuck y'all. <laughs> and they were potentially going to pull Spider Man. And they're like, you're going to take him out of the MCU and all this stuff, right? Everyone's like losing their mind. They're getting pissed at Sony. I was in the camp of Sony being yeah. like, nah, dude. Sony believed in Spider-Man way before MCU. You know, they thought yep. they thought Spider-Man was dope. They were the first, bro. They made the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man which are great. <laughs> they're the they're the they're the ones that are responsible for my favorite Spider-Man. The uh, costumes, which, which is co- the, yes, I still have the action figures of the first Spider-Man, the yeah. Goblin one and Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. They're they're responsible to my favorite Spider-Man movie that exists as of yeah. now, which is the. Uh, Freaking the, um, Spider Verse, yeah. yeah, insane. Yeah. It's it's the best version of Spider Man I've ever seen. Yeah. I think that the reason is also because they care about the artists in that movie. Artists yeah. have their way to express them. So I was on Team Sony, dude. I was like, no, <laughs> fuck Disney, dude. <laughs> like they, yeah. they got too much money, man. Like they can't be buying all these. Like, like Sony deserves a huge cut. Yeah. There is an argument to be made that Sony actually made superhero movies truly popular in the way that mcu took advantage of right yeah and so like i think people are just like so infatuated with the mcu which let's be clear here i am as well i love the marvel cinematic universe but let's not get this twisted (laughs) you know (laughs) when stan lee was like on the new year of bankruptcy two studios really saved him out which was uh fox and sony you know yeah there would be no MCU if these companies didn't help finance Marvel by licensing and ultimately buying these IPs from them so that they had exclusive movie rights to these. Uh, Sony has exclusive movie and game rights to Spider-Man, right? That's why Spider-Man is exclusively on the PlayStation. So this is this is what that looks like when you license out a, a thing. You know what I mean? That's what that yeah. looks like. Because they don't truly own it, you know? Mm -hmm. um but like for instance marvel owns uh spider-man just not in movies video games and i think even tv shows i'm not sure uh an extent because sony has purchased that a long time ago does that make sense yeah and so so they technically were like hey man let's like meet in the middle you know and we'll do like a, um, I forget what it was. I think it was like a 75, 15% or like, I forget the percentage, but it was highly in favor of Sony, right? Mm-hmm. And then Marvel's like, let's do 50-50. <laughs> and 
And Sonny's like, or something along those lines. And Sonny's like, get that. I still fuck remember out of here. that they wanted more money. Yeah. For example, 70 30. And Sonny was, no, fuck you. <laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah. The movie's mine. Why yeah, 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 you yeah, give yeah, me yeah, my yeah. money? Yeah, yeah. And so, so I, I think just people got had blinders on a little bit. That's all. Uh, not all people. So there's a lot of people in my camp too that were just like, yeah, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Like, this is Sony's in the right here, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. Like, Disney owns everything. They have money that they can spare, right? Like, why are they so greedy? (laughs) You know, like, why do they want so much goddamn money? Like, Sony was like, no, this is kind of cool. We should be a part of this. This will be great. It's helping everybody, you know? And Disney's like, yeah, but let's help ourselves a little bit more. Like, we did kind of, like, make MCU tight, and it's pretty awesome, and we're really thinking about making, you know, Spider-Man the next Iron Man, and it's going to be great. So, like, but we're going to do all that work, you know? And so it kind of makes sense that we should get more money, and Sony's like, we didn't tell you guys to do that. (laughs) We didn't force you guys to make him so important to your cinematic universe, (laughs) you know? Um, you guys wanted him in Civil War so you guys can tell the story in Iron or in uh, Infinity War and 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 beyond. Like that's great, but Stewart has a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, I keep going on this <laughs> rant about. But to answer your question before we move on uh, to Kimberly specifically, um, that's the legit way, okay? Which is like official licenses, okay? Mm-hmm. And. Uh, just remember me when I say this too. Uh, it seems weird to kind of defend larger corporations when it comes to this stuff, right? Because you're like, oh, well, they have like a lot of money, and like, like why can't they? At some point, I think there's some truth to this, but you have to you have to side on this kind of uh, this this all or nothing approach when it comes to creative um, creative ownership, okay? Because once you start to give in uh, a little bit, it actually will affect you negatively, the, sm- the small fry, okay? Like you wanna have this type of same kind of access to copyright laws that these big studios do. You know, they exploit it at some high level, right? But there is some rationale to that, expo- uh, aside from the expo- uh, exploitation of it, but like the actual pure ownership and how much power that ownership has right protects us little folk okay a, a great example like the law uh, especially in america i'm not sure how this is in other countries but in america for instance if i didn't like if, okay so this painting i just did it's mine right you guys all saw me do it all that stuff once i post it online it's officially it's officially mine it is pseudo copyrighted okay mm-hmm. meaning that even though i didn't officially copyright it right it doesn't matter. Like if I went to the court of law, I would win. Even if somebody else took it and copyrighted it, they would lose that battle. You know, because those yeah. ownership rights are super strong uh, in the states, specifically. You know what I mean? They're here in Italy too. Yeah, and and the corporations do find ways to exploit that at, at the most nuanced of levels, right? But it's one of those things like free speech. It's very like, you want to be very careful on what that means right and what you silence you know because maybe right now it seems convenient to silence one group of individuals because we all disagree with their opinion but it's it's dangerous when that that kind of uh system that was in place to stop that is reversed you know what i mean Mm -hmm. uh when it becomes majority opinion is more important and we can censor people based off of minority opinion that's really dangerous you know what i mean um, I do believe there's nuances there and there's, there should be, I have like a, I do have a fundamental philosophy that's counter free speech, but I'm not going to get into that. It's not political science class. <laughs> okay. But, but I am like, uh, when it comes to at least copyright stuff, like I do think it makes a lot of sense to be very like overprotective on t- in terms of IP or pro- ownership. So if someone came and tried to say cease and desist on, anything that I did, I would probably be like, all right. Even though I would think that I was legally bounded by like my fan art, right? For instance. But if you want to be a legit, legit licensing, that's the best way to go through it. And if you're small fry, it's hard to get those licenses. <laughs> okay. 
um, like my current studio, that's literally what we're doing. We're fighting for licenses of certain IPs for our next project. Which makes me think it's all about that IP, man. So I'm making this game, making my own IPs. Uh, Super who had a question? Born with this. Who had Thank a question? You. There's uh, a no question problem. from Stuart. I can say it if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I just didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, not a problem, man. Um, I was curious about your general. Maybe this is too broad of a question, but your it's thoughts on keeping uh, like a good work-life balance and keeping concept art engaging and staying creative, especially when it's something that you have to be able to do on command and do it when you don't feel like it kind of thing. And also maybe if you have any thoughts on keeping yourself healthy, such as posture and preventing injuries and stuff like that as well. Yeah. Um, so I do have some good strategies for this, but I also have to admit like late, lately I've been doing a terrible job. So it's not like it's a foolproof system. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that every time I implement this stuff, it, it does help out a lot. In fact, I just thought about it this morning. Uh, I had a good conversation with my wife, you know, and I was like, I need to start making some changes, you know, and she's like, let's do it. Um, and what, what it really comes down to is just auditing your day to day. It seems boring, but it's good to do. Okay. Like literally like scheduling your days and having a forgiving uh, schedule. Mm. Okay. So for instance, uh, let's imagine, let's imagine that I uh, set, okay, so for instance, tomorrow I, I have to go to an appointment at this time, and then I have work at this time, and then I have another appointment here, and then I have kid stuff here, right? So it starts to getting overwhelming. I have all the stuff, um, looks like a, I'm spelling the word awake. Look at that. <laughs> and then I eat here. There you go. Awake. Strategy is stay awake. <laughs> no, um, no, like this is just like the thing. But when I write it down and see it, right, I could start to figure out where to move things, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I try to see how much time I actually have. And I'm like, all right, I have game development time here. Let's use it for that. And sometimes I'll notice that like the day is over, right? And I couldn't get to like three of these or something like this, you know? And so what I usually do is then I re-audit my the, the, the next day. So instead of having like, let's say four or five things on that day that I was going to do, I'm just going to, like let's say there's four or five challenges. The next day I just do two, like one or two. And I'm okay with that. Like, I just accept that I have to slow down a bit. Because mm. like you said, it's about that balance. And right now it's not balanced. I'm doing too much too often. So I get overwhelmed and I feel tired and I feel sick, you know? And that becomes detrimental because eventually I crash, you know? And the lessons I've taught you guys throughout the class is that consistency, you know what I mean? Mm. And if you create a system that's not going to maintain consistency, then it's a bad system. Right. And I know this because I think of it in, in long terms, right? I look at the 365, like 365 days out of the year. I try to aim for like a 200 plus uh, day of like doing things that I care about. Like I should be spending about 200 days plus doing either like, you know, personal work, you know, uh, or and or kid family time. Usually just family. I'll just put FT. And this can be and or, right? Like I should have this much time devoted so I can keep my personal health pretty positive. You know what I mean? Mm. And I, I do look at this as like, this is also equally balanced. Like both of these should have 200 plus days. You know, even though there's not 400 days in a year. What this means is that I double down on a day on doing both these things, right? And when I feel one is overwhelming the other, you know, then I just try to pivot around that. But 200 plus, that's what I'm looking for long term. And then when I find myself 
doing 200 plus that but then i'm also doing like work right and a lot of this stuff starts to fall off the wayside because this is taking up 100 percent. that's when i started to feel real weird i'm like what what's happened what have i done what have i changed so i audit it that's why i audit right okay and okay. i know what to sacrifice what not to sacrifice so for instance uh that started happening so i was like okay what am i spending time so i was writing down my hourly time and i realized uh, I'm working out a lot. Like what had, what had ended up happening was uh, I would work out. Like at first it was, it was a great solution because I would work out like 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Right. Throughout the day. Cause I couldn't have just like one hour of just full workout. Right. But then what ended up happening was that these 15 minutes uh, would add up. I would like work out a lot during the day, you know, like I would find out that I would have more times to take breaks and I'd spend 15, 20, 30 minutes sometimes even, you know, and I do it like six or seven times throughout the day. Like whenever I go out to the garage, I'll start working out. So now I'm like, okay, this system of breaking it apart throughout the day is a great system, but I'm, it was so loose that I was adding 30 minutes out of my day, 60 minutes out of my day extra and working out maybe too much because it wasn't really, there was no schedule to it. The whole strategy was just piecemeal. So I'm like, all right, I got to cut this in half and look at my re workout regimen and change the standard. Cause what I was doing was chasing a certain weight lift, uh, weights lifted. So like last week, like, let's say last week I did 30,000 pounds worth of weights moved. It doesn't mean I, I actually lifted 30,000 pounds, but it's like, you know, 10 yeah, sets total of volume, right? Yeah. Total volume, like 10 sets of a hundred pounds is a thousand pounds. Right. Mm, yeah. Does it make sense? So like did, doing that a lot, but it wouldn't just be a hundred pounds. It'd be like, you know, maybe 200 pounds for like 15 sets or 15 reps. Right. For like four sets, you know, that's, that's a lot. Mm. And, and then sometimes lighter weight, about like a lot of, a lot of reps. So again, it will add up to like three to 4,000 pound sets, you know, so I was doing like 10 sets, you know, of like three or four different workouts. And that's what would get me to this number. And then the next day I'm like, all right, now let's go for 35. And then let's go to 45. And to be able to do that, I had to spend time lifting more reps, you know? So now I've, to make this attainable, I just changed it to 20,000 minimum, hmm. you know? And that's a good workout. And I spend about an hour at the most you know? Right. Yeah. And now I get that hour back. Other things. Uh, I like on my phone a lot. Sometimes I just spend too much time on my phone. It's just a thing that we all fall into. Uh, some of it's productive, but I call it um, positive procrastination. It's like when you watch a lot of really good videos about what you need to do and improve, but then you don't actually <laughs> put any action to it. Yeah. Yeah. I so, that very but, well. <laughs> but that's like a, a huge time sink. I spend a lot of time. I'm in game dev, so I'm in, I'm in this mode right now where I'm researching way too much versus application. And I need to kind of set in the strategy of like the piecemeal game development, right? Where I, it's okay if I have 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there. I don't need like always five hours to sit down and work, right? I did that when I was learning programming, actually, and it worked out great, you know? Mm. Um, so I just need to do that again and be loose with it and just keep evolving this. But the re reality is to audit it every day, you know? Yeah, yeah. Take, take your wins, take your losses and adjust. I think what ends up happening for a lot of people um, is that they create like this ultimate plan. And then they, as they begin to follow through, pieces of it break apart, things they didn't account for. And because of that, you know what I mean? Um, they just ultimately just give up on the whole strategy. <laughs> Too optimistic, eh? Yeah. Where I'm like saying, it's okay to start with that, but then adjust. That's the part that's missing is that it's okay to adjust. Mm. You were wrong. <laughs> okay. You made, you were too optimistic. Like you said, uh, adjust the optimism. Uh, mm. I rescoped my game twice already. And I, I know that it was a third time that I can rescope it. I haven't done that yet. Right. It's right. still the same game. Like me changing the art style is not necessarily rescoping. That's common. I was anticipating that, you know, rescoping would be like, if it was originally fantasy, now I'm changing it to sci-fi. If it was a fighting game, now I'm changing it to 
a MMORPG. <laughs> That's different, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's still the same kind of game. Uh, the things that I scoped was originally my first in- incarnation was not only was it sci-fi, it was this huge, um, uh, like, it had, like, a lot of depth in terms of the game mechanic uh, and leveling up. And I realized I should just get rid of leveling up and that whole core system, you know, uh, for now. And then that was the rescoping. Um, and then the second rescoping was now went from 3D to 2D. That is a huge change. Okay. That's the second rescope. So now right. the, the third one that I can imagine if I really wanted to, to rescope this even further would just be a game type change. Like if I just change the game genre again, Right. If I start to find that the game mode that I made is not that fun, I'm giving myself one more out. But I have to really think about why it's not fun. I haven't yeah. gotten there yet, though, so I don't know if it's true or not. We'll see when I get there, when I actually make something. And I'm prepared for it. Hmm. And if uh, the preparation for that is that if I don't like the game that I've made in terms of what I thought it was going to be fun, but it ended up not being fun, then I'm just going to copy another game and just make a slight twist to it and then make that game. Does that make sense? Something that I already know works and that's already fun. Just recreate a lot of that and then just add a little bit of a twist. It could literally just be that I, like, let's say if I was doing fighting games, I just copy Street Fighter, but just make it all painterly. That's the twist. That's it. Yeah. yeah. But it's literally I'll recreate Ryu and Ken, but just in my versions, you know? But like, I would have a really good example of something that works and that's good. And I just had to like learn that. And then it'll teach me a lot about why my first uh, idea that I fo- followed through with wasn't fun. You know what I mean? Mm. But I don't know, man. Like that's, that's the thing. Like I, I tell you guys, you should study a lot. I tell you guys, you should make, you should fail. You should learn from those mistakes. I don't know what mistakes I have. I don't know what those mistakes are yet in the game development, solo game development, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do think that the wisdom that I've obtained from working in the game industry for many years is helping me, like that experience. But as I talked about many times before with the soccer player analogy, like the goalie versus the forward, right? Just because I've worked in game development in some capacity doesn't mean now I'm just like, I know every part of game development right mm. um i will say that the pieces that i've already learned are huge like i'm already feeling like i'm a better overall game developer already even in this few weeks of like making my own thing like it brings me i already feel i have more value as just a, an overall uh, developer right right so it's not like a waste even if uh, I were to say like just completely stop right now. I don't have any attentions to it because I really do want to make this thing. But you get it. Mm. Any you, other uh, question? I got a oh, question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I would ask you how about getting a job in the, in the movie industry is different with the gaming industry? Yes. Because our station is mainly focused in the gaming industry, I think. No, there's uh I think it's mostly just high level game and uh mm-hmm. film. I think that's what our station's main demographic is. I don't I wouldn't say that it's entirely game. Um there's a lot of people that are very, very uh they popping off on that site that work in both industries. Um So getting in the film industry is a challenge because there's unions and those unions tend to uh, prevent new talent from coming in easily. Um, And if you're not in the union of some sort, usually what ends up happening is that you're brought on as some sort of consultant or some sort of shorthand freelancer, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But you can not work more than like a month usually or not for too long unless you get grandfathered in by some sort of um, director or some sort of producer on the project um, that really wants you to work on that project. In fact, it's like, I'm, I'm very, very much about social, um, 
social programs and social goods that are part of our governance as a society on this planet. I believe in a lot of them, right? Um, and unions is one of those things that makes sense to help people like protect themselves from larger entities like corporations, for instance. But interestingly, I think that in terms of creative industries, it doesn't actually make 100% sense, at least the model of a union that exists as we see it, okay? okay. And I'll explain it this way. Um, so when you think of like a union in terms of a construction worker, I think that makes 100% sense, right? So if you're a construction worker, you, you being on the job for many years actually has a lot of value. Your seniority does have value and it should be rewarded as so and protected, you know? There's a lot of dangers of being a construction worker, right? That if you're not properly compensated for, let's say, some sort of incident, that's, that's devastating for your entire family who may be responsible for your, um, your livelihood. These features, I think, are the best parts of what a union can do and should do, right? Um, but in the creative industry, why this is a challenge is that there are many people who've never worked on a game or movie ever, like many of you guys, for instance, who can like make artwork that's just as good, if not better than the people who are making images for games and movies currently, right? So that senior, seniority like completely doesn't make sense. Like there are artists that I know for a fucking fact that are much younger than me and I think are far superior than me <laughs> in terms of concept art. And really, they just need to learn like maybe like a month's worth of like working in the industry. <coughs> like working in the industry for like about a month or so <coughs> to learn kind of the ins and outs. Like I don't, I think even like give them two months crash course and then they'll, they'll know how to work in, in our industry, right? There's not much mm -hmm. to it, you know? where maybe like working as a construction worker, there's like different types of molding, different types of like people, uh, architectural code. Like there's all this stuff, man, right? Yeah, it's just not, you can't just learn on day one or even in a few months. Like it does take real experience to kind of understand these things in a really good way. Again, I don't think it'll take too long, like maybe like a like fucking day or two, or sorry, like a year or two, but like, I think it could probably take like, uh, or sorry, like not like 10 years or something, but it could take like maybe a few years to really understand these, you know, at a senior level. And plus, like I said, that part I do appreciate and I actually do think that makes sense for even our industry. But like, it's easier, the rationale to protect seniority makes more sense in this field, right? In, const in construction, where in, um, in our industry, it just doesn't make any sense. Because just other than the fact that people working in the industry forever, right? Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, there's people that can just start day one and already kick ass. And I know this for a fact, both because I, I've seen uh, artists on Lark Station that I think can do that. And two, I've worked with people that literally came out of school and did just fine. And working at mm -hmm. the same level as me, right? Because they mm -hmm. were at the same level as me. They were highly skilled artists. And that's what you need. And the, the second part is like, it's not really dangerous. And that's probably the biggest factor of what unions really protect people from. Like you're getting like black lung and shit working in coal mines, right? Yeah. Um, the worst that we can get is just like working long hours, but every job has that fucking shit, yeah. <laughs> you know? And even then it's like, we're, we're not doing physically strenuous stuff. It's just more sedentary. It's, it's avoidable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not part of our work risk. <laughs> like you can do something about it. Like I got a standing desk for instance, right? Um, I take breaks frequently, you know? There's ways around it. And so- That was my other question, so good job. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so like, so for me, it's, it's like, when I see that in the film industry, it's really kind of like sucky because a lot of people can't get in because of that specific thing and only can get in because of some sort of circumventing around it, right? Um, and many people have done that. And 
the way to do that is to be highly skilled, like amongst the best. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or work for a very specific studio, like a visual effects house. They tend to, that's a, a way to get around it. Like a visual effects house will hire you as like an employee, you know? So th- it's not the studio's not hiring you individually, they're hiring the studio to the do the studio. concepts. Yeah. Um, now, that's like my argument against it, right? And it's like a fee to get in, all this stuff, right? Uh, my argument for it, though, and this talks about the game industry now, the game industry does not have this. Like, it's like everybody's like a studio. So they're like hiring people. It's like working at McDonald's, right? Mm. But just like working at McDonald's, you get paid fucking slave wages. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So you get paid very poorly comparatively to film. To give you uh, a couple examples of my previous income, when I was working on a movie, uh, I was getting paid around like $5,000 a week, right? Okay. Which is a lot, dude. And yeah. then it was the worst project I ever worked on. I totally didn't care about the money. <laughs> In fact, this is evidence because I took a pay cut that was literally went from five thousand dollars a week to five thousand dollars every other week. So literally got paid cut in a half. Okay. Okay. But I was working for a game studio, you know. Mm-hmm. And you would like to think that you know having health insurance and all that other stuff was would be helpful. I didn't get any of that. So really, it's at the whim of whether you get full time or not at a studio. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but that's because I fight for my wages and that's still pretty high for what I do, you know? Yeah. And uh, there is no protection for people in our industry, especially in the game industry specifically. Mm. Uh, they get overworked. They get threatened in their job. They don't get any kind of protection, you know? And... Uh, like again the union part of it doesn't make sense like this is the challenge that unions have because unions cannot protect workers from a failed project does this make sense like when you're in construction they're building that house yeah you're just doing it (laughs) right yeah Yeah. uh if you're a coal miner you're uh, mining that coal and i think when they started shutting down coal mines that's evidence of when unions can't really protect people and in the game industry, we like coal mines are shutting down all the fucking time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. There's no guarantee that like, hey, we got this job at this cane company, make this game. And in two years, like let's say you're making a MOBA and in two years, MOBAs are just out of fashion. So now yeah. your game's going to be a complete failure. How is the union going to protect you from that? Like the studio is not trying to punish you, <laughs> right? It's the market that's changed. <laughs> and so this is why it's a real challenge. Uh, both in film and games, but at least in film, there's always they're always making movies. And if you're one of those like artists that are in the art department, you just move from movie to movie, so you kind of are protected in that regard, regardless of how the movie does well or not. Game industry doesn't have anything like that because games don't take like years to make, like a year or two. They take like several years to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's changing. I think the solution around both film and game, by the way, like the the great equalizer, is the ease of making each of these is getting easier and easier smaller teams are starting to form more and more they're making blockbusters yeah you know, both in movies and in games right hmm. i think this is how it's, this is going to be solved it's not that studios are going to get their act together and or unions are going to figure out some sort of um uh creative way to protect you know creatives i think it's that creatives are just going to make their own shit and they're gonna make a living off of their own stuff, their own content, hmm. which I think is the the ultimate solution. Yeah. And I, th- I think it's happening more and more. Um, and so, like, you, there's a good chance that when you guys start to work in years, few years, you're gonna be working for smaller teams, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's how they're gonna get around it, right? You're gonna have teams that are like Pixar, they like a company that make an animated film and they just hire you to be part of their company and then they just pay you well. Like more companies are going to be like Supercell who have like mm-hmm. huge return on their investments yeah. um, in terms of the context of people. Maybe not that. They're like multi-billionaire. I'm saying like 
if a, a, a five people make ten million dollars and it was a team of five, that is totally sustainable. <laughs> right? Even though it's only ten million dollars compared to like you know hundreds of millions of dollars that like Red Dead Redemption made, you know. But if you're like five people, then each of you guys got two million dollar paychecks before taxes, right? That's great. Uh, the guys who made Nidhogg, I've been researching independent development. It's just two people. It's like a guy and a lady. One person manages all business, the other person just makes the games. And I'm like, that's pretty much all you need. And uh, they make games every four or five years. That's because the first game they made just did so well that they're like probably still living off the profits of that game. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you live a modest life, you could totally do that. Like if you make $10 million and just be like, all right, I'm going to just not change anything about my lifestyle, you could probably retire. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Just... If you change your lifestyle, then you, yeah, then you're gonna have to make more money, right? If you're like, all right, now I'm gonna live in like a one million dollar home, you know? Yeah. And now you have to pay property taxes off of a one million dollar home, then you're gonna need to make more money, right? But if you're like, no, I'm just gonna still live in my modest little cottage out in the woods, <laughs> you know, and just like make my organic coffee like I've been doing, yeah, like nothing crazy. You just live like a simple life, then absolutely you can maintain a whole livelihood. In fact, that has been my mission for the last four or five years is to live a simpler life. Get back to the basics. But anyway, getting to the job stuff. Yes, there's challenges in both. Uh, it's much easier to get into the game industry. Um, not because there's no opportunities for film. It's just that there are, there are definitely gateways to get in film. It's changing though, so I would be optimistic about that. And I've worked with both games and film. And I prefer games. Prefer making games or prefer the gaming industry? Prefer the gaming industry. Ah, okay. That's my personal take. <clears throat> it's not objective, it's just my personal take. I haven't worked in the animation field enough to have an opinion about that. One last question. I got to get out of here, man. I'm tired. I'm like, <laughs> I just woke up, started talking for six hours or so. <laughs> I need to lay down. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've got a question if nobody else has one. Yeah, go for it. Um, you said earlier that um, there's not many great um, tutorials out there or guys doing tutorials for illustration. But you said that there was a couple of good books. Um, are there any mm -hmm. that you can recommend? Yeah, uh, Framed Ink is one. I think that one yeah. is it's less about illustrations, more about storyboards, but uh, he explains it so well and it's, it's related. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the other one, I think it's less, again, it's also less about illustration. It's a uh, practical light and color, but it's a lot of the philosophies about how you manage light and color are really helpful for composition. Yeah. Uh, another one would be Dream Worlds. That one's all about comp uh, composition. Mm -hmm. And then I think any and all books that talk about comic book illustration or comic book paneling. Yeah. Highly, highly recommend anything like that. Anything that does that. Like they're all pretty great. They always have some, some nuggets that I can't really put my finger on one. Okay. Because yeah. that, that whole thing is about storytelling with one picture or two, you know? Mm -hmm. and um like how to draw comics the marvel way for instance is even though it's old and archaic they made a new one i think but even the old one is still super solid because it does talk about a lot of the principles of an illustration you know uh, and i'm sure there's just like straight just how to do illustrations i haven't really looked into it but uh i know those ones help me make more dynamic images and illustrations uh for a fact I can't think of an illustrator who really taught me how to make good illustrations. You know, um, I've seen a lot of tutorials on how to like paint an illustration. If that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Like how, this is how I do it. Like I do my line art and then I do my sketches and then I just, do, and then there's no philosophy. There's no like fundamental ideas. It's like, yeah, the rules of third. It's like all this stuff I kind of already know and character. It's nothing that changes my whole, like, Oh, that makes perfect fucking sense. Uh, like when I watched a lot of the Noman DVDs, for instance, on concept art, there was a lot of that. 
like oh that changes my whole perspective you know and That's i'm not it. sure why i'm not sure why and I, I could be wrong i mean there is a person out there that's just like perfect at explaining how to do illustrations I think yeah. I think that's kind of why I I took your class. I like I know you're more well known for your, your concept art stuff, um, and I've been watching you like through YouTube and on Instagram for for years. But I just find the way that you break stuff down makes more sense to me. Even though I want to go in a different direction, like it makes a lot more sense to me than yeah, totally. you know a, a four hour time lapse that's been sped up to twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of those. A lot, lot less just like thorough illustration philosophy. Uh, other than like some so, some old archaic art, artistic like methodology, which is in my opinion a little too artsy fartsy, mm -hmm. you know, it's like uh, the heart of this is what makes this painting so good, you know. Like, do you see the movement? Like, that's just just too floaty. It doesn't really stick, right? It feels yeah. like very fleeting. Where like I'm like certain values make good images <laughs> you know like like if you just have strong values and this is what i mean x y and z and you just follow through it doesn't matter what you're designing right whether it's for cartoons illustration film you know it's just yeah. a matter of how you move that slider between them but this is like the theory of design and if you want to get a lot of that i got a lot of that stuff from places like in industrial design transport uh, transportation design product design because that's all those motherfuckers worry about it's like when you see something you want to buy that <laughs> right yeah. and those are consistently true okay yeah and they have a really good ways of explaining it and that's like again in the concept art world like scott robertson man like he's all like this is what makes good design let me explain it to you mathematically <laughs> and you're like oh shit yeah. you know that can apply to illustration too um but there's not an illustrator that thinks like Scott Robertson, at least that I, I can think of. I really can't think of any of them. Like some of my favorite ones, my favorite illustrators, like when I heard them talk, they're, they're very illustrators. <laughs> they're just like, I don't know, man. I just like put this here. It feels great. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, elaborate, bro. Like explain to me. Like, I don't know, like uh, my buddy Victor, uh, who's a League of Legends um, illustrator, like he might have some stuff. Like every time I talk to that guy, he's pretty smart. But mm -hmm. I don't know if he's a, he, he wants to spend time explaining it to others. He's more interested in just changing the fucking standard. <clears throat> but anyway, like I don't think Wing Wei would be able to explain to me why he does it so well. Even King Jung Ji, he doesn't really do a good job. He's just so impressive, though. You know? Yeah. yeah he's just like, I just do it. Have you ever seen him when he... <laughs> no. When he... When he breaks it down and then after he's broken it down he says yeah but i don't actually do it that way <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know exactly what that feels like because that's something that i realized that i was doing a lot because some yeah. sometimes people will ask me what am i thinking and i'll be like well this is what i'm thinking and i'll tell them like all the philosophy and the fundamentals of art but then i realized i don't really think about any of that stuff so i changed the way i taught that or teach that so now i say i don't think about anything and i explain why that that's true right then mm -hmm. it, it makes sense when i start talking about the fundamentals saying i know this i know how to do this i know how to do that and it's just ingrained in my subconscious so i just do it now right mm -hmm. and that's better way of teaching because it does two things it, one demonstrates that this person cannot just if i just tell them what i'm thinking and how i'm thinking about it they're not going to all of a sudden fucking do it right uh, and it does another thing which demonstrates that uh, fundamentals are key and you have to master them to be able to get to this point where it looks like it's effortless, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It does it services two things. It creates no illusion around how to get there, uh, but it also, uh, it, it really explains that it is, it is very, very muscle memory based, right? That there, it, it is kind of a trick. You know, it looks like it's a trick, but not a trick like uh, I learned this trick and now I can do it. It's more like a uh, if I was learning how to do magic tricks and I was learning how to do like a sleight of hand thing, I had to practice sleight of hand constantly mm -hmm. until it's just second nature, right? I can literally show you how to do this card trick, but now that I've shown you, it doesn't mean you can do it. Like an acrobatic, like doing a triple backflip gainer, 
right? I've talked about this before. I can tell you exactly how I do it and what I'm thinking. I was like, oh, I just think about making my head point north and then I can stick the landing every time, right? So, okay, mm-hmm. so I just got to think about that and then they just jump and they break their neck, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's not the same. You can't just do it, even though that's true what they said, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so like, yeah, people like Kim Jong Ji was probably true what he's getting at, but he also probably messed up the the point of like, yeah, but I also did this for like thirty years and filled up sketchbooks to the point where I had to get a storage bin, <laughs> you know, yeah. to like <laughs> actually keep them. And that that's the part that's kind of missing from when people explain stuff, and people need to hear because they they leave that that thing inspired. They try what he said and they don't get the results, and then they think that there's something wrong with them. Mm-hmm. when in reality he told them the truth he just forgot that disclaimer oh yeah plus 30 years <laughs> i do this times 10 you know and yeah. and then and then that saves people from the humiliation that they get put themselves through uh if, especially if they're paying attention if they weren't paying attention then they go through it anyway <laughs> you know Obviously. but but anyway um that's those are the recommendations and i don't want to say that they don't exist i almost certainly do exist great illustrators who can explain it very well you got to mm-hmm. do, do your own deal do, do diligence to find them but That's anyway great. thank you yeah man i gotta go guys it's been a great class i appreciate you guys' patience you. sitting through this and also uh you guys have done great work man uh appreciate y'all the links I sent you guys, I think a few days ago, are going to be good for quite a while. So be sure to download them or save them somewhere safe. Okay. Uh, the class will still be available to you guys. You'll be able to watch and look through stuff if you guys want. Um, but at some point, it will change so you won't have access to it. But till okay. then, okay. Thank here's... you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so Bye. much, AJ. Yeah. You take care, the friends. Baby. <laughs> thank you, man. Talk to you guys later. Cheers. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.